we have yet another case for you today. A previously healthy two-year-old girl is brought to her pediatrician by her mother. The mother explains over the past couple of weeks, her daughter has gone from being able to run and play independently outside to frequently falling over and now requires assistance with nearly everything, including picking herself up off the floor. Until this point, the patient had hit both her cognitive and physical developmental milestones. The patient's vitals are normal, and physical examination demonstrates obvious power deficit in all four of her limbs. Laboratory tests show elevated serum muscle enzymes, but reveal very little else. Over the next few months, the girl's condition continues to deteriorate. She loses almost all movement in her body, with symmetrical weakness being more pronounced proximally, but she retains some motor control in her hands, feet, and face. After another two months, she loses the ability to clear her secretions and is hospitalized with acute respiratory failure, requiring mechanical ventilation. The patient's condition largely plateaus at this point, and after several months in the hospital, she's discharged, remaining wheelchair-bound and ventilated. All right, let's pause there. Any guesses on what this patient might have? As it turns out, this patient had juvenile polymyositis, also called JPM. It's an extremely rare autoimmune myopathy. This disease is very similar to juvenile dermatomyositis, also called JDM, with the main clinical differentiator being patients with JDM often have cutaneous symptoms like Gottron's rash or heliotrope rash. JPM, on the other hand, has no cutaneous involvement whatsoever. The underlying causes of both diseases are unknown, although research suggests that there may be a genetic link and an environmental link. For example, risk of JPM might be higher in people who have a mutation in the human leukocyte antigen gene. Similarly, people infected with Streptococcus pyogenes may also be at a higher risk of JPM, as the epitopes on that bacteria resemble the epitopes on human skeletal muscle. The primary clue for juvenile polymyositis is the progressive symmetric proximal muscle weakness, although it's exceptionally difficult to diagnose given its rarity and lack of cutaneous symptoms. It resembles other neuromuscular disorders like Duchenne and Becker's muscular dystrophy, infectious myositis, and metabolic myopathy. It's a disease often diagnosed by exclusion, and it can be differentiated from other congenital myopathies by its subacute onset. The European League Against Rheumatism and the American College of Rheumatology developed diagnostic criteria to diagnose and distinguish juvenile idiopathic inflammatory myopathies like JPM. We've left a link in the video description to the diagnostic criteria if you want to review it more closely. Now, blood work may reveal elevated levels of serum muscle enzyme, although it's not present in all patients, and serum levels may return to normal a few months after initial clinical symptoms, despite continuing muscle weakness. Other blood tests may also be abnormal, but they lack specificity. While biopsy was the most common diagnostic tool in the past, MRI is the first choice these days. Inflammation will appear as bright spots within the muscle on a T2-weighted image. In cases where myopathy is suspected, a whole body MRI may be considered instead of just imaging the shoulders and the thighs. Not only does MRI spare the patient the discomfort of muscle biopsy, but whole body imaging allows you to monitor the progression of the disease throughout the body. If MRI is unavailable or contraindicated, muscle biopsy can be used to confirm diagnosis, and it will reveal T cells directly invading skeletal muscle fibers. The goal of treatment is to stop the progression of muscle inflammation. High dose glucocorticoids combined with a steroid sparing agent such as methotrexate or cyclosporin will suppress the immune system and allow muscle strength to recover over several months. With treatment, patients can recover completely and be weaned off steroids within a year or so. Some patients may experience periodic relapses in symptoms, and others may have chronic symptoms for the rest of their lives. 
We hope you enjoyed this case, and thanks so much for watching. We have a bunch of other videos that we've made previously, so be sure to check them out.